Welcome to episode 185 of the Formula One Grid Talk podcast. Today, we're here to review a dominant win from Charles Leclerc at the 2022 Australian Grand Prix. My name is Ruby Price, and joining me, we have host of the Monkey Seat and F1 Firesides, Tom Horrocks. Hello. Steve Jackson from Formula Shakedown. Kia ora and good day. Good day. And uh, Tom Downey from Everything F1. Hello. Hello. Uh, but first, if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five star rating on Spotify or a five star review on Apple Podcasts. We'll shout out all of you who do to say thanks. Um, I had actually some names I needed to shout out and I forgot to get this ready. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, to shout out a Patreon, uh, Mary Beth Broadbent, our first Patreon. Thank you so much for supporting us. It means a lot. And with your support, we can uh, make the show a little bit better. Um, there were also two um, names which are in a completely different chat. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, shout out to Matthew901, um, who is the leader of the Tom Downey fan club, who we've got right here. Um, and also shout out to Anthony Johan, um, who says that this is a great podcast for female F1 fans. Um, but yeah, we'll shout out all of you who do uh, give us a five-star review to say thank you. So thank you. Um, and if you're one of the 74% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So let's get on to the race. And let's start with you, Steve. Um, Charles Leclerc, a very dominant win. Was that the story of the whole race? Or, you know, was there something that people should know that just didn't happen or happened? Well, this is this is the thing. Whenever somebody has a entirely dominant performance, as they they're sort of conspicuous by their absence, we didn't really see a huge amount of them. But that's like in this case, it's a good thing. Usually, it's either you don't see them because they're miles out in front, uh, or they've DNF'd and they've uh, walked back to their uh, to their motor home, so uh, or to the hotel or wherever they are. So, um, yeah, just he's been very very in control for most of the weekends um practices sort of that's i don't think it's hugely reflective early on early on in the weekend so um yeah the important stuff is qualifying bossed it race bossed it fastest lap bossed it you know like he just he did everything he needed to so um yeah a weekend that couldn't have gone any any better i think i thought it was quite funny the little the bit of back and forth he was having with his engineer regarding the fastest lap um definitely wasn't necessary but he's he's hungry like he wants this desperately and uh interesting quote or well not a quote from him but just a bit of a i might be sort of paraphrasing here but he addressed some comments regarding this um uh sort of charles 2.0 that we're seeing and he's He's refuted that and basically just said that it's a, it's just like his development's been linear. And I would agree with that. It's just the fact that Ferrari have now built him an absolute monster of a car. And when you put an absolute monster of a driver behind the wheel of said incredible car, amazing things happen. So um, I made some comments regarding the race just as it was going on. And um, yeah, uh, Charles is... Uh, like his is his his is nice and straightforward. He is the benchmark for the season. I think he is the yardstick, and he is the one to beat. Um, like unless miracles happen at Mercedes in the next couple of races, because they really need to get their act together. Um, and Red Bull apparently uh, gives you fires now. So um, in terms of contention so far, there's not a huge amount of consistency there, which helps Charles. That's not his problem at all. And as long as he remains consistent, this is his to lose. Yeah, absolutely. And he did actually need to set that fastest lap at the end because Alonso's lap would have dethroned his previous fastest lap. So he had to go for it. He had to go for it if he wants um, that 33-point lead, I think it is, over George Russell in P2, actually. But we'll get to him in a second. Tom uh, Horrocks, two Toms. Um, Sergio Perez had a bit... It looks like he had a quiet race from the standings, but you know he had to make a couple of overtakes. Um, a very good pass over Lewis Hamilton on the back straight, I think it was, just before we had one of the safety cars. Um, how would you rate uh, Sergio Perez's race? Because it wasn't perfect. No, it wasn't perfect, but it was actually a very complete weekend for him. He looked, he looked strong in qualifying, uh, did, just didn't quite pull it all together in, in Q3. 
but uh, but just generally across across the weekend, he he can be proud of his pace. You know, he was matching Verstappen for pace pretty much for the for the whole race. I know the Mercedes race pace seemed to come come back at them, and you know, there's a probably a little bit of fortune around the the safety car, but equally as well, the safety car did drop him back behind Russell, so he then had to attack and pass George Russell on track, which given the track, or well, no, it's a lot easier this year, but given it, it's uh, it's not the easiest track to overtake. And I think we've seen that the least on track passes so far this year today, that that's clearly not a, a given that he can just draft past them, but uh, he still, he still made it count. And uh, yeah, solid performance from, from Checo overall and um, well ahead of his teammate in the championship, which after three races, I don't think a lot of people would have predicted. So uh, no, it's, um, I think he can be very happy with his performance. He's uh, he's definitely a lot closer to Max this season. We've uh, we saw he was a, a definite step behind. But this new generation of car uh, it seems like it's uh, it's a little bit oversteery, which suits Checo's style a bit more than uh, I know Verstappen likes it very pointed at the front end. So that that's kind of. F1 seems to be coming a bit more to him this year, which is which is good for him, and uh, and it's going to keep Max on his toes. So uh, I, I look forward to see, seeing more of the fight. It's a, it would it would be good to see an inter team battle in Red Bull rather than just having Red Bull being the the one driver team fighting against two Ferraris and two Mercedes and two McLarens. It'd be good to see a little bit of inter team rivalry in there as well. So no solid performance from Checo Perez. Not like not world beating, but uh, probably. Probably his, I mean, I say apart from the last race, probably his most complete race for Red Bull, I'd say. Oh, Ruby, sorry, you're on mute. I am on mute, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm waiting for uh, Helmut Marco to start putting bricks in the back of Perez's car should uh, he start challenging Verstappen on a regular basis. But um, let's talk about George Russell, Tom Downey. Um, first podium for Mercedes, second podium of his career, uh, first podium earned during a race because Spa doesn't count, but um, lightning start and just, you know, got lucky with the virtual, was it virtual safety car or act- actual safety car? But, you know, a safety car very much played very well into George Russell's strategy today. Yeah. Um, Russell did have a bit of stroke of luck with either the VSC or the safety car. Again, I, I can't remember which, which one it was. Um, but, you know, like I said before, and, you know, like I now pretty much always say about when you play the hand you were dealt, and when Max basically blew up in front of him, you could argue that Russell lucked into position, but he ended up in the position he was in, and he'd still done, you know, a good enough job on Saturday to get his car into that position in the first place, and he still had a good start to the race. So, you know, so he didn't completely luck into it from, like, 12th on the grid or something. Um yeah, you know, he um he, he didn't he didn't have to do an awful lot from what I saw of him, mainly because you know he wasn't he was never really going to catch Perez in front. Um because Perez and and Leclerc and Verstappen before he DNF'd were you know, they they were you know they, they were running a different race basically. Um but but yeah, but George was holding it well. Um, I'm glad to hear that Mercedes didn't even consider, well, from what I heard, didn't even consider saying, you know, move aside for Hamilton. Maybe that's because they know they're not directly in a title fight. Um, but, but you know, but, but, you know, but George looked comfortable in that car. Um, more comfortable than I was, pat- well, you know, more comfortable than maybe Lewis has as, uh, during the start of this year. Whether that's the car, whether that's the driver, I don't know. Um, you know, historically Mercedes have never said, "Oh, it's just the car." You know, how the tables are turned. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, it, it, was, it was a decent, decent race from decent race from George. Um, it does look like he's sort of bedding in well in, into that Mercedes team. He's obviously going to be learning an awful lot off Hamilton um, because, like him, loving or loathe him, Hamilton is one of the best drivers we have ever seen. You know. There's no denying he's one of the most successful drivers we've ever seen as well, and he's been in the sport an awfully long time. Yeah, he's he's, he's he started this sport when I started in uh, when I started in secondary school, uh, and I'm now 27. So yeah, so you know, he's he's been around the block a few times, um, but it but it, it was a good race uh, from from George. You know, you know I'm going on the tables a bit now. Um, yeah, learning an awful lot. Learning an awful lot from Hamilton. It feels 
almost like it's a somewhat passing of the baton. And this is almost going to be one of the youngest podiums we've had for ages in, until Verstappen DNF'd. Wasn't aware of that, but that's an interesting statistic. I mean, it's we're always going to end up having the youngest podium coming up soon because they're so young these days. You know, Yuki Tsunoda's 20. Um, but yeah, uh, on to uh, Lewis Hamilton car, 44, finishing P4, Steve. Um, three seconds off his teammate, but, you know, like we said, his teammate got ahead during the safety car pit stops. Um it was a good race, I'd say, for Lewis, considering the car performance. Um, and mostly as well, you know, it all came from that start of getting ahead of Perez right at the start and then managing the tyres very well. Yeah, um, well, it started off well and just sort of started to stagnate and get a bit weird towards the end. I'll, I'll get to that. But um, yeah, start was incredible. He took full advantage of Checo having a back out of a good run out of the uh, run into T1 just because Max was sort of slightly slower and just got in the way basically and Hamilton saw a massive gap and just said thanks um, and just you know that's that you know did, did exactly what you'd expect any uh, racing driver to do um, wasn't looking like he was in a position to uh, outright threaten George on pace alone he was there or thereabouts but he wasn't really like there wasn't any particularly strong sector of, of, of you know of the of the circuit where he was actually able to you know gain reliably lap on lap it was all a bit sort of all over the place and I don't know whether that was um just the 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 quirks of this Mercedes that we've seen so far this year or if it was uh was tires obviously we had a a, a a very rare step change in compounds. So we had C2, C3, and then C5. So whether there was, um, whether that C4 tire was left out intentionally because they knew that would be a bit too, I don't want to say a bit too competitive because that sounds a bit daft, but um, I think they've possibly done this just to mix things up a wee bit and perhaps the Mercedes and Lewis especially just wasn't able to adapt to it as well as, uh, some of the runners around them. Um, the thing that grated me with Lewis was towards the end of the race when he uh, he jumped on the blow to Bono and and basically basically said the team put him in a difficult spot. Um, I mean, George capitalised on a on a safety car or VSC. I think it was the VSC where he pitted and basically you know gained um, gained a handful of seconds and and got himself ahead. I mean that that happens. Um, Lewis has benefited from benefited from that sort of thing countless times in the past i think every driver on that grid has uh, been the victim and also the beneficiary of a, of a safety car at some point or another so i thought that was unnecessarily harsh i mean him basically blaming the team for the position he ended up in is um is not going to help anyone um and that says two things to me one is he's obviously very unused to being in the positions that he's found himself in i mean p10 at the human rights meme gp was bad enough but um like this is this is fairly unknown territory for lewis he's he's quite used to uh, i i won't use the word term getting his own way because he works incredibly hard for the for the results that he has um but he's not used to being in these positions um so obviously a bit of frustration does kick in there and you know you can say things in the heat of the moment it happens we've all done it but this is different when a basically everything on team comms is uh, fair play for them to broadcast um, and B is very early in the season and Mercedes are obviously working very, very hard to understand where the issues are with that car. So um, no, I don't agree with what Lewis said there at all, but um, you know, that aside solid race P4 points in the bag. Um, and you know, we've got, we've got 20 races to go. So I won't call this over, but I think, you know, same same as uh, uh, I mentioned previously, Merck need to do something probably in the next two or three races to have a hope of staying within arm's reach of Red Bull and especially Ferrari. But um, yeah, overall P4, not bad. Um, I would expect them to uh, to move forward as the season progresses though. So I don't think we'll see Lewis and P4 for much longer or going well. Yeah, fingers crossed that we get cars performing at the level that they're supposed to with the reliability that they're supposed to to add some neutrality to it uh but tom horrocks uh lando norris p5 
nearly 30 seconds off Lewis Hamilton ahead of him, you know, but I think McLaren will count this result as a win. You know, they've got both cars up in the top six, um, obviously some retirements ahead of them, but, you know, this is, if not further ahead, this is at least where McLaren think that they should be fighting right now, as opposed to, you know, as we saw in the first two races of the season, fighting at the back for Nafal. Yeah, it's definitely a, a big step in the right direction. I think they'll be slightly disappointed in that where they had one driver ahead of both Mercedes, that both drivers have finished behind both of them because they look very similar on pace. But as you saw on the race pace, the Mercedes clearly have, was was in a in a different league to the McLaren today. But uh, as you say, there it's a great um, it, it's a great kind of it's kick started their season. Double points finish is exactly what the doctor ordered, especially when they've moved it up a little bit as well. Um, George jumping ahead of them as, as well in the uh, incentive car, getting well into the distance as, as would have hurt them a little bit. But um, Lando especially getting uh, step, holding off his teammate after a, after a pretty average start, to be honest. The first phase was just a little slow, and then I put him on the back foot all the way down to, to turn three, to be honest. And uh, But holding off his teammate nicely, all, all fair, love and war there. But I, I do think this, this can be considered a bit of a false dawn, though, just a little bit... Um, I'm, I'm just a little bit cautious in my optimism, um, and uh, it, it's the issues they've had with brakes, climat, climatic conditions would have massively suited McLaren today. Given that it was, you know, it wasn't by any means cold, but you know there was potential rain in the air later on, and and it wasn't, it certainly wasn't a hot race like they've had. Even even in the night race, it's still you know was still fairly humid, and I'm just a bit concerned it might just be a flash flash in the pan race, given that. Albert Park is so different to any other circuit we're going to any time. So um, I'm just slightly concerned by that. But that being said, they did show pace at Barcelona. They've now, they reckon they've caught up with all the time they lost in testing when they obviously they lost Ricardo for, for two days and, and all the problems that they had with the, with the brakes and everything. They feel they've caught that, that back up. So now we're kind of like, the season basically starts from here. So if they can maintain that position, that's great. Um, I'm not convinced they will be able to, but uh, uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, but it's it's they they need to if they can hold that fourth place. I think that's that's kind of got to be their target. But the Alpines are looking strong. Um, so it's 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 going to be difficult to say how it's going to pan out long term. But I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be the start of the season for them. So uh, Lando, uh, I'm sure he'll be very happy to finish ahead of his teammate. He definitely had some problems towards the end of the race as well. I think Daniel alluded to it in a post-race interview. He said that Lando was nursing a few issues and and the team had to tell him to be sensible, um, whether that was code for don't pass or whether it was just code for, uh, you know, just just don't, you know, don't do anything stupid because Lando's got issues. Uh, I'm not sure, but... Uh, but no, it's it's um, le- leading home fifth place. It really, was kind of the maximum they they could have got. Um, they probably could have got a P um, P P five P six with Verstappen uh, finishing the race. So I think they'll be happy overall. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tom uh, Downey, um, your bold prediction in the preview was that Ricardo would get a point. Well, he did that. He got eight of them, and. Um, it did look at one point a little bit nervy as he came out of the pits and just was so slow that he nearly lost positions to Albon and Stroll. But, you know, he managed to keep ahead of them and ultimately finished right behind his teammate um, in what was, you know, uh, we just obviously talked about McLaren's performance so far, but, you know, it was a pretty strong to the relative extent performance from the Australian in his um, Grand Prix. Yeah, Um no, because I always start with Danny Rick. Yeah. How can he be like P6, P7 one weekend and then P16, P17 the other weekend? Home advantage is not that strong. Uh, it's strong, but it's not that strong. So my cats just want to, and one of them just farted and it stinks. Um, I'm pretty sorry, it's really distracting. Um, yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 it Danny Rick, I mean, he used to be so consistent. Um, and we and weekends like like this, like this weekend, is 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 where is where we see where he's so good. Um, you, you know, you know, he, he was a bit slow coming out of the pits, but we know that these twenty twenty two cars with bigger tires and the you know the pit stop regs and everything, we know that they're going to be slow coming out of the pits or the rest of it. And bearing in mind that his tyres were obviously not going to be sufficiently warmed up, or all, all the rest of it. Yes, they were fresh, but they 
you know, you know they probably still had this greasy surface on them. So when he was coming out of the pits, he did really well to hold off Albon. And was it Stroll was coming was trying to come through as well? I'm pretty sure it was one of the it was definitely one of the Astons. I think it was Stroll. Um, yeah, it was because I remember thinking I'm surprised he's not turned right by this point. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was it. it it, it, once he sort of fend, fended those off, especially when Albon came down the main straight at a rate of knots, I thought Albon was going to absolutely clatter into the back of him. Um, but no, Danny Rick, you know, he he, he held him off. Um, at one point, I did even wonder in the race if he was if he was running quicker than Lando because because it looked like he was somewhat holding back pace. Maybe that's because Lando had this reported issue more in the race than we thought. I don't know. Um, but it was when they were sort of stuck in a bit of a DRS train. I remember watching them come down turn three to turn four. Um, sorry, turn two to turn three. Uh, the second DRS run, whatever that is, I think it's turn two to turn three. I don't know. Um, I, I was watching that and I was thinking maybe it's because he's got DRS, but then I realised Lando had DRS off one of the um, uh, off one of the Mercs in front of him, and I was like, no, Danny Rick is here on pace, um, and, and yeah, he was just a. Uh, it was a, it, it, it was a good weekend, and I just hope that we see this more consistently from him. I just really, really want him to to see him do well because it was so good to see him with a big smile back on his face. You know, just you know, just just see him happy, and just to see him, you know, just 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 looking joyful. Um, yeah, it's just you know, you because because nobody wants a sad Danny Rick. You know, nobody deserves a sad Danny Rick. We want a happy Danny Rick. And Danny Rick's at his best when he's late breaking, um, you know, actually yeeting it up to the inside of people, all, all the rest of it. Hopefully this this result will will sort of give him a you know, give him a bit of a spur and be like, right, come on, we can do this next weekend. Oh, sorry, not next weekend, weekend after we go again, all that kind of thing. Um, but I said that last year a few times and it didn't come to fruition. Yeah, it's they just need some um, consistency, really. And who knows? This might be the springboard. This might be the full stone, as uh, Tom Horrock said. But Steve, let's talk about Esteban Ocon. If there really is anything to talk about Esteban Ocon, really, because I don't remember a single thing he did during this race, other than pit for hard tires. Was there anything that you saw? Uh, not really. But I mean, <laughs> I, like. He's the epitome of the quiet of the uh, quiet achiever this season, um, at least from my view. I mean, six in Bahrain, uh, seventh in the uh, human rights meme GP, and then seventh again today. So, um, like by all accounts, he's doing he's doing a very good job. Like Alpine have shown flashes of pace that would rival even Red Bull, maybe Ferrari if the you know, if the wind was blowing the right direction or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of TV coverage, we got his pit stop. Um, I did note that the pit stop was a little bit slower. I think it was around four seconds. The left rear was a little bit uncooperative going on. Um, but really, that was probably the most excitement he had today. He had a very clean race. Um, I looked at some of his onboards, nice and clean. No problems. Um, he l- actually looked really, really quick through that first sector. Actually, coming out of the uh, the, the sort of like twisty complex into uh, on the run down to turn three, actually looked very, very good. Um, car looks nice and stable. Was turning in exactly where he wanted it to go. He wasn't having to, you know, um, correct the thing or counter steer on the way out. Like it was a very, very tidy looking car you know to to quote gary anderson neat and tidy package um <laughs> saw tom rolling his eyes there i did that i might i might have done that intentionally mate i'm sorry um but uh yeah like uh, to me like this is exactly what he's um you know what he's being paid to do like the alpine has got pace but over a over a race distance it does you know we've, we've seen it sort of you know foot you know sort of fall off uh, not a cliff but um it doesn't quite have the legs to to keep pace with the sort of you know uh the front runners so at this stage it's a strong midfield car Ocon to me is a strong I'd call him a strong midfield driver yes I'm aware that he won in Hungary last year but that was a very odd race um so uh yeah I, I that's exactly what I'd sort of expect from him and he's been he's been very consistent so um yeah good result 
good job for from his side of the garage at least with Alpine. Obviously, uh, obviously Alonso is a slightly different story, but we'll get to him later. So, um, yeah, I, I, it was tricky because I've I've actually um, taken the time to make notes on every driver we've had today, uh, regardless of whether they're finished or where they placed or whatever. Ocon's is literally just Ocon's first stop was slightly sticky. Left rear took a moment longer to get attached. Done. That's all. So, <laughs> so like I said, conspicuous, uh, inconspicuous, but um, yeah, did a did a really good job today. Yeah, and it it keeps him seventh in the championship, which is you know when you discount the um, top three teams, that's best of the rest. Um, so yeah. you know you can't complain about that. And a driver who you know had a similar race to Ocon, but you know. I did note his particularly good pass on Yuki Sonoda, Tom Horrocks, uh, Valtteri Bottas, who is absolutely relishing life at Alfa Romeo at the minute, isn't he? Yeah, I like this Bottas, um, which is weird because it means I have to like Alfa Romeo, which I have to say this year I'm actually enjoying Alfa Romeo. The uh, the, uh, the the all-new driver lineup has definitely reinvigorated my passion for them. And the fact that they've got a decent car, is, uh, they've actually got a purpose of existence now. They're not just at, at the back trying to fight Williams and Haas and uh, not making the best out of the seemingly substandard package they have so no i'm actually i'm 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 full on board the hype train for uh for for alfa romeo this year i'm actually enjoying watching them and i'm enjoying watching the smiley valtteri bottas back he seems to be relishing the team leader role um he seems to have clearly have his, his teammate who vastly inexperienced teammate um in his pocket at the moment which is great he's coming forward in the race it's disappointed to see that he didn't get that q3 but i, I do think that alfa romeo are going to gradually fall back as the season goes on but you know, not getting that Q3. It was going to happen at some point this year. It was just a case of how long he could hold on for. But uh, but his race was was a good race. You know, uh, we've often criticised Bottas for not being able to move forward in races, and uh, and he's done it. He started 12th. He's got got up to eighth place. He made a nice pass on Sainz on the first lap. I know he was a little bit. Uh, compromised with um with his start and was a bit all over the place um but he just seemed to spend, spend the entire race fighting stroll it was pass and okay that's weird uh <laughs> cat's just destroying the green screen um yeah he's uh he's just like passing and repassing stroll and then um and there was he, he got i think the worst part of this race was he did get caught napping after one of the safety car restarts he's uh stroll just completely barreled past him and um and it was a good overtake from stroll to be fair to him but um he got him back again and then stroll seemed to be back ahead of him again which i didn't see what happened there um got pushed off a little bit cheekily by stroll but uh but but again got back ahead when stroll um oh my god what is going on outside <laughs> something's happening the cats are going crazy um yeah so he he got past him again and then he Oh my God, what is going on? I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> um, I think we should probably maybe move on to someone else while I sort out these cats because they're going mad. But yeah, good performance from Bottas. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Tom, uh, Pierre Gasly, a bit of a disappointing day in qualifying yesterday, um, but he's brought it home to be P9 and you know, Alpha Tauri being the team that they are. Um, I think with how close the midfield appears to be this season, you know, picking up the occasional point here and there, is the thing that's going to make a difference. So, you know, I think finishing P9 today is what they should have hoped for. Uh, yeah, so I just got distracted because I just saw, just saw Tom just pick up a cat and disappear um, as one of mine has walked in. But it's all go today and good talk. Um, yes, uh, yeah, good... Um, Good race for, for Pierre. You know, you know, you're much like Bottas, you know, started outside the points, going to the points, was was bringing in some good moves. Um, I, a good, I think he was having a good, uh, good ding dong with a Haas at one point. That may well have been when, uh, when K Mag attempted to pass him and then just missed a breaking point. And at one point, I thought it was going to rear end him, um, possibly into the 910 chicane. I think that was. Um, yeah, uh, when uh, I did notice on on the commentary uh, on Crofty's on Crofty's commentary, um, when uh, when when Max's engine blew up, he, you know Crofty and Crofty, he he then got all excited and said, "Oh, Pierre's got an issue. We never heard anything about it again." So, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if if he did have an issue. If he didn't have an issue, um, is he the only Red Bull power, powertrains power driver to not have an issue? So far, because obviously we lost both the we lost both the works drivers 
in Bahrain, and obviously Sonoda didn't even get to start, bless him, uh, in in Saudi. Is, is Pierre is, is Pierre had a DNF or a DNS? Yeah, he? car basically like went on fire in Bahrain as well. Um, can you? Sorry, uh, sorry, catch this one, did that they're very hungry. It's a very um, cat friendly podcast, this one, isn't oh, it? I know, yeah. Right. Come here. Well, off you go. Sorry, got to be a cat dad. You can just see him in the background there. Um, yes, yeah. I, I apologize for all of your listeners um, and our radio viewers. Uh, yes, um, yes, yes. So, yeah, the, the, yeah, much like Bottas, you know, you're sort of, sort of just like starts outside the points, had, had, had a good race, and it's just, just nice to see him sort of happy and smiling and just 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 having a good weekend yeah absolutely and uh, steve a driver who will certainly be happy after today you know after being disqualified from qualifying yesterday for not having enough of a fuel sample um and you know williams generally seeming to be underperforming how in um a pg friendly way did albon finish in the points today considering he didn't even hit until lap i think it was 55 or 54 this was uh and if you're a jimmy broadbent broadbent fan you'll you'll get this this was a proper dave council council of dave moment just absolute master plan waiting until the very last second to spring it um Basically what they did, and I think this may have been uh, originally them gambling on a late safety car, which is fair in Melbourne, like it's it's not out of the question for a, for a street circuit. Um, yeah, uh, I obviously that didn't happen, so they just sort of had to put him on the last lap because there's no, I, I think this has been discussed on the Sky commentary as well. There's no black and white penalty for that. It's sort of, determined by the overall factors like was there a reason that he couldn't pit for some reason or or so on and so forth but it could have led to a to a disqualification um obviously that didn't happen so he pitted on the very last lap and effectively crossed the line in the pits which echoes michael schumacher from many many moons ago if you've been watching f1 for a while you know what i mean um it led to some very unhappy people but um no in this case it's a perfectly legitimate sort of um result um he did an amazing job for hanging on to that car for 58 laps on tires that basically would have been petrified by that point they would have been absolutely absolutely shot so um yeah really good drive uh again fairly sort of boring drive for him there was a bit of a tussle with Daniel Ricciardo and uh, Lance Stroll when Ricciardo came out of the pits after his uh, after his stop and they all sort of found the same bit of tarmac at the same time so um, yeah really nice that he managed to keep his nose out of it he did show a bit of racecraft which um, which is sort of nice for his resume as well but more importantly this moves Williams into ninth in the Constructors Championship ahead of the five-year plan team uh, who we'll obviously come to later as well. But um, yeah, good result for Williams. Um, I think uh, he's, I mean, he's running rings around Nick uh, Latifi at the moment, um, which isn't a particularly good look considering Nicholas is sort of the incumbent driver. But um, yeah, we've seen what Alexander Albon can do. Um, he was obviously with Alpha Tauri and then Red Bull and then you know, took a year off, drove DTM, had a good time. So, um, yeah, no, it's nice to see him back. It was nice to see him sort of in the mix a wee bit as well today. But, um, yeah, that's a it's a bold strategy that did pay off for them. However, I think at any other circuit, this probably wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been the case. Um, just you know, uh, like, uh, half the circuit is new, so tarmac is. Uh, um, very, very different to a lot of the established circuits over in, in Europe and that sort of thing who may not have had the same treatment, spa aside. Um, so, yeah, like, not not bad. I'm just impressed that he hung on to the thing for 58 laps. Yeah, absolutely. And on that tarmac thing, I think this was, I think I remember hearing that this was the first time that Albert Park had been reprofiled since its conception. Yeah. It's um, never been re- it's never been resurfaced in its twenty five years or something ridiculous. 
yeah, that is ridiculous. But, you know, it it's worked in the past. But, you know, now I think the circuit, based on the one race that we've had so far with the new layout and everything else, seems to be working so far. You know, we got overtakes, which looking at the mo- most recent of uh, Australian Grand Prix was not that common. Um, but Tom, Horrocks, let's look at uh, Guang Yuzhou um, behind Albon. So they'll be disappointed that, you know, they missed out on the chance to get ahead of him given the um, very late, what was it? Um, yeah, the very late pit stop that we were just talking about. Mm. But it was a bit of a quiet one, I would say, as well from him. Yeah, um, the the guy who, who blessed my dad. He doesn't watch Formula One a lot anymore, but uh, but he uh, he he christened um, yesterday during qualifying. He says, "Oh, who's this brand new Joe?" Uh, which I thought that was, that was quite amusing. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. But uh, yeah, so uh, Joe Guanyu, um, he was he has impressed me because I was very against him getting the drive because you know I'm not big on on pay drivers in Formula One anyway. But and he, with four years in Formula Two, I thought you know. He's fully Jolie and Palmering this, just like hanging around in the formula until there's no one left that's any good and then getting through based on experience. Um, and, he, and he didn't even win the championship. So I was very against him and that. But, you know, he's here and he's it's going to be great for Formula One, him being here. And he's he's equipped himself very well so far. You know, he's clearly not a match for, for Bottas, certainly not at the moment. But um, but he, uh, he he passed Alonso. He passed Stroll towards the end. He may have had a quiet quiet race there, but uh, he I think he would have been hoping for that tenth place from Albon with the uh, with the final pit stop. And um, Albon came up pretty much side by side with him, and uh, and they had a real battle down to turn three. But um, Albon just about held on, so he'll be disappointed. But it was a, it was a it was a good race. He kept it clean. Um, he's shown that he's not he's not crashy, which is great because. Alfa Romeo can't really afford to have crashy drivers. So I think with Joe and Bottas, they've got drivers there that are going to allow them to score points when points are available. More so for Bottas. Um, but if Joe can be that that backup driver who's who's there, you know, there, there might be the odd race where you've got them both in the points and uh, and he's there doing the rear guard action, protecting Bottas while Bottas, you know, holds on for a podium or something. It could potentially happen if they get the right circumstances. And provided they continue working as a team, I think they've... Uh, they they they're getting good value out of him. He's uh, he's not horrendous. He's certainly not a world champion driver yet, but he's uh, he's certainly shown that he he deserves a place in Formula One, and it, it's not taken him five years to become a decent driver like other paid drivers. So uh, I'm very happy for him to be there at the moment. So uh, yeah, good good on you, Joe. And speaking of other paid drivers, Tom Downey, everyone on this podcast favorite driver at the minute, Lance Stroll. Um... Did two pit stops under a safety car, so he got the medium tyres out of the way to fulfil the obligation to run more than one compound, um, and then just went until the end. But, you know, he ended up with a five-second penalty for weaving. Ultimately, based on the time sc- screens, it didn't make that much of a difference because he was already behind the cars in the first place. But, you know, what what do you make of Von Stroll's race? He at least finished it this time. <sighs> Oh, Stroll, where do we begin, hun? Um, blame it, heck. You know, just... Uh, how can... I said this yesterday, right, about Quali. Um, you know, after he tried to make relations with his fellow Canadian on the grid. How can you make such, like, fundamental errors? It's like, is, is he determined to become the villain on the grid or something? Um, you know, he he seems to have this ornate ability to sort of just yeet into everyone and everything in sight and just be like, what was that? You know, he's just, he, you know, he's just, oh my God alive, he just boils my blood, honestly. It's like, is he trying to take over Mazepin's sort of being public enemy number one or something? Because if he is, he's going the right way about it. You know, you, you know, you, you got a five second penalty for for her weaving. You know, he you know, he, he arguably pushed Bottas off. Although I think I think Bottas was still thinking about his porridge at that point because he seems to be going quite slowly. Um, and and I think I think under the new rules, it is apparently okay. Um, that's music to Max's ears. Um, so yeah, I I, I 
I just don't know what to say. I mean, he's been in the sport for since 2017, for God's sake. This is what his sixth season now in Formula One. And it's, it's just if Aston Martin want to score a point this year, never mind regularly score points, they need both drivers to be on it. They need both drivers to be guessing points, to be not making these stupid, stupid mistakes. Um and, and just you know, just just driving, just driving like an idiot. I mean, F one. I said this. I'm going to say what. A, oh, off, no, 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 no. Off you go. Off you go. Off you go. Off you go. Sorry. Um, sorry. Cat just appeared on on on. on sorry. Cat just appeared on on the desk. Um, yeah. No. No. no stroll. Just uh, the what I said yesterday. So rings true. F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. These are apparently 20 of the best drivers in the world. I'm not saying they're 20 best drivers, 20 of the best drivers in the world. And yes, F1 does to, does need money into it, and some drivers bring money. But also some drivers who bring money go about it in, in the right way. You know, you know, Lando obviously brings money, but I wouldn't class him as a pay driver. At the minute, Joe was doing all right. You know, no incident like this. Um, what you know, where we've seen them sort of smashing into people, all, all, all the rest of it. But uh, I just, he, he's just, you know, you, you know, he's coming. If this is his first season, you could perhaps somewhat forgive him. But this is his sixth season, and he knows, he, he knows better. And his whole attitude, his whole demeanor of, it's not my fault. I don't want to sound like that guy. But it does stink of rich kids that get me out of anything kind of thing. It screams to me of, oh no, uh, something's gone wrong. I need to, um, you know, I, need, I need to get out of it, and I'll throw money at it. It shouldn't be happening. And Aston Martin, especially with the cost cap and everything, it doesn't matter who's in charge because they can only spend a finite amount of money, and. They're going to be running out of, you know, they're going to be running out of money pretty damn quickly if Stroll decides to keep punting into drivers and getting fined and all the rest of it. I know Seb didn't have a perfect weekend either, far from it, but he's coming back from COVID and we'll get on to him in a minute. But Stroll, just put it this way, if his dad didn't own the team, he wouldn't be in a seat. End of story. He'd have been out years ago. Um, and we'd have had someone else in there. Maybe, you know, we'd have had Hulkenberg or we'd have had... You know, uh, you know, maybe George Russell would have moved into one of those seats from Williams earlier. I don't know. The point is, we'd have had someone else in there. But, you know, just if Stroll wants to carry on in F1 without irritating every single person up and down the paddock, drivers, team principals, everybody, chefs, you know, anybody you can think of for, for, for teams, he, he needs to really, really look at his conduct, look at how he acts on track, Look at how he acts off track. Strong words from Tom Downey on uh, Lance Stroll. Um, but let's move on to Mick Schumacher, Steve, who had a bit of an error strewn um, race. You know, he uh, went wide and lost two positions early on. Um, and then also nearly hit Sonoda under the safety car. Now, I obviously, I don't know who was mostly at fault, but it seemed to be just a matter of one person was braking whilst the other was accelerating. And ultimately, he's finished 13th, a lap down. Um, but really, for Haas, it seems like a bit of a back-down-to-earth weekend. Yeah. Um, bit of a... It was a yeah, bit of an odd weekend overall. I mean, Kev was feeling crook for most of it. Mick, um, yeah... I don't know. I don't know if it was uh, just a bit of nerves left over from uh, from Saudi. I mean, I can't blame the guy. That was a hideous accident. But obviously, we've, you know, looking at the weekends in a vacuum, not amazing. But he did at least beat Kevin on pace, which is uh, which is you know, which is something. The Sonoda warp speed straight into his backside almost thing was very very strange um i rewound that a couple of times just to have a look at what was going on and or try and figure out what happened 
Um, I don't know. I I can't see Sonoda slowing down all that much. I think Mick may have just gotten the gotten the source and well, not not the source, but you know the one that you know delivers a thousand horsepower. Um, but I think he may have just you know given it the beans and not realize that well not 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 notice that Yuki was there, but maybe not realize the the, the speed differential. So that was nearly a rather hideous accident um one thing i did see on twitter fairly early in the race was people blaming mick for uh, signs going off no signs went off himself after trying to go around the outside of mick at uh at turn 10 um that happens when you try and go around the outside on turn one on tires that aren't up to temperature so that aside um yeah a bit of a bit of a messy race like what i have to remember with mick is that he's not his dad um that's something that i think a lot of people sort of potentially overlook and they go he should be you know he should be way up front i mean max verstappen is incredibly talented his dad wasn't so you know like like lineage or who your dad was or that sort of thing doesn't necessarily equate to your competency as a racing driver i still i still rate him um but yeah this is a bit of a bit of an off weekend bit of a shame it's gone to steiner's birthday i would have liked to have had a nicer result for the fella because it's it's nice seeing happy upbeat gunter back um as funny as sad angry gunter was at times um it is uh, it's nice seeing a team that have had previous form return to that previous form but obviously this weekend was a bit of a a bit of a dead rubber for them but yeah like uh, i i I would put it down to potentially anomalous both their drivers were uh probably not at their best um so yeah um i think we'll get more of an indication once we get to some established european circuit so i wouldn't consider imola one of those so i'd say give it a bit more time before we you know sort of judge where Haas are because whether they're batting above their weight uh or punching above their weight is probably the better term um in the first two races of the season i don't know uh but we do know that that ferrari power unit is incredibly potent i mean it's not it's not anomalous i mean alfa romeo are well thought of where people would have expected them expected them to be as well so i think it is um i think it is genuine performance uh but tom made a really good point earlier and i'll, I'll extend this to house as well i would expect house with the budget constraints they have relative to the other teams to not maintain this for the year but i mean if they do i'll be chuffed because so far um they've looked pretty good this weekend aside yeah absolutely and i agree with you on the uh, people need to remember that mick schumacher is not michael schumacher you know they're almost expecting this driver in his second season to have already won seven world championships and you know that's just not gonna happen but uh tom horrocks let's look at k mag the um has teammate um said he was feeling a bit nauseous on uh, I think it was Friday or Saturday um, and ultimately you know he decided to copy signs but show him how to survive that corner in itself um, when he had a go at Sonoda and just ran across the grass but you know ultimately it seemed a bit of a quiet weekend for the Dane as well. Yeah I, I think it's you can't understate the the difference he's making to that team because you miss him for one Friday a Friday session and all of a sudden look look where the team are you know he's uh, he he was under the weather wasn't really wasn't really up for up for things and and his fa- you know him not being able to set that car up correctly and I think that that has is, is nowhere I think it, it was never going to be particularly suited to this circuit anyway given what we've seen so far from it but uh, but he, even so he just the the difference in just him not you know, not being himself I think has definitely impacted the uh the, the Haas team um yeah he n- nearly taking out Sonoda at the start um he had a bit of a bit of an unta- untidy race but uh, like you say again um showing science how how it's supposed to be done cutting across the grass um he stayed out under the safety car to just try and make something from the race but he was never really gonna do anything with it it wasn't a great strategy to be honest and I think you know, coming coming out on the on the medium tyres was they showed that you know Alonso proved that those tyres just weren't set to do any kind of real distance. Another reason why we didn't see the soft tyre apart from Alvin right at the end, which um, which I think to be honest is the reason Alvin was able to stay ahead of Joe, which I should have mentioned before actually, because he would have had so much more purchase off that turn one to be able to keep that position. But um, but yeah, he's uh, 
it was just on a bit of a hiding to nothing, unfortunately. Uh, you say it's it's. I think they will be stronger in in other races, and I think they will um, get back up there, scoring decent points. Um, I, yeah, it's probably looking at like a sixth place for the season for them. Maybe it's uh, you know Magnussen. What was he? He was. I think he was um, sixth place last time we were here. Uh, people forget it wasn't that long ago that Haas were actually a decent team, and I think he qualified seventh and finished sixth last time we were in Melbourne. So it's uh, on on the face of it, there it's um, uh, it's he's gone backwards. But uh, we all know a month or two ago he wasn't even in Formula One, so it's still he'd take that hundred percent. But yeah, he showed some good defence as well when um, when he kept, he was fighting with the McLarens and um, when he when he was on the older tyres and he showed some great defence. But as I say just the strategy in the end, uh, he ended up passing Mick on track and then dropping behind him at the end with the graining on the tyres. So it was it was just. Yeah, I mean, you've got to try something. He was never going to get points given what was happening with his race. So try something different and you might get points. And it just didn't work today. Um, but I do think that he's, um, I know he's finished behind Mick today, but I think he's really showing what that team were missing last year. With, um, I don't think, I mean, that car was bad last year, but I, when you've got no decent driver setting that car up, I think he's really showing just how much they threw away last year because I think that car could have potentially scored points last year if they'd have retained either Grosjean or Magnussen so uh, yeah they're definitely uh, buyer's remorse with the with the Mazepin uh, the Mazepin time so uh, yeah it's it's uh, it's good that uh, yeah that they're still there and they will come back but just just a bad weekend just chalk it down to experience this weekend and go again next year we always know they throw away points in Australia it's kind of what has to do they, they just it's just surprised they got through the pits without leaving taking the wheels off this time so uh, baby steps baby steps Baby steps indeed. And uh, talking about the baby of the uh, grid, um, Yuki Tsunoda, Tom, um, my only notes for him are about things that other people were doing around him. So, you know, Magnuson trying to overtake him and going off, Schumacher nearly driving into the back of him. Um, and I think that might have Bottas passing him. Um, did anything happen that was Tsunoda's doing in this race or was, it, was he just a recipient of driving around? Uh, no, he was just out for a bit of a Sunday drive and people were just sort of seeing him as easy pickings, I think. Uh, I didn't notice anything particularly good or particularly bad about him, which may in itself be a good thing, to be honest. Um, you know, you know, after he's had a bit of a interesting 2021 season, you know, it's good to see him uh, just sort of getting his head down, cracking on with what he needs to do and, you know, just... Just viping as he's going around, really. Um, I don't really have an awful lot to add because I didn't really see much of him apart from when he was in, you know, you know apart from when he was the like he said, was like when he was recipient of other people's you know, misdemeanors or what have you. So, yeah, you know, it, it, it didn't see anything to spectacular from him. Um, did he, he didn't finish in the points, did he? No, so yeah, so just yeah, nice try, but. That's why we're talking about him at this stage of the podcast. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, this, yeah, this, um, the, the, uh, this, this weekend's Grand Prix with the timings of everything, because obviously, you know, uh, three out of four of us here are UK based and Steve's our resident ocean, oceanic region person. I need to call him Australian then, but he's not. Um, don't you swear at me. <laughs> it's like calling me English. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, you know, the, the, the timing's a mess for me a bit this weekend, you know, because uh, I have an early alarm during the week, but I don't like setting a 5.30 a.m. alarm on a Sunday. Uh, but yeah, but now, but you know, it's a good, good chance for Steve and some of our other colleagues to get, get their own back on us. Yeah, absolutely. Normal times for uh, Steve this weekend. And uh, Steve, let's talk about Nicholas Latifi. Um, first to pit, I think it was. So you came in for the hards on lap 14. Um, so just after a safety car? No, sorry, Stroll was the first to pit. Um, but Latifi basically set off the rest of the uh, stops. And, you know, he finished the race. I think that's a, a good point. Um, but other than that, not much to say about Nicholas Latifi from me. Yeah, uh, I mean, finishing the race is a good result considering the weekends that he had um obviously you guys went into uh into 
a bit of a discussion regarding that incident, so I won't go there. Um, but yeah, like besides, um, I think he was the I think he was the trigger for the first round of stops potentially, um, which is pretty typical. Uh, I mean, Lance pitting on lap one, I wouldn't really factor that into that whole cycle. I mean, once he did that, he was well off cycle in terms of normal pit stops anyway. Um, but yeah, like the the issue with Nick now is that he's being well and truly outshone by his teammate, who's um, fairly new to the car. Um, I'm I'm saying this with all seriousness. Hasn't really broken the car yet, whereas Nick has had a couple of rather significant accidents. Um, and again, for a team like Williams, just like Haas and just like Alfa Romeo and um <laughs> aston martin as well um crashes are expensive especially with the budget cap so um yeah like i still do think that he's a competent formula one driver does he deserve to be there i mean that's entirely subjective um it depends on your point of view of who would be deserving as a, of, of a of a drive in formula one um his presence has helped williams survive as a team um and also transition into a period of new ownership where they do have a lot more money and potentially a bit more direction but we're we're not seeing that direction sort of come to light yet they're sort of where they were last year which is a massive shame and whether they're uh on a understanding sort of run plan just learning the car and learning its sort of limitations and quirks and so on and so forth not sure um Albon's pace today, even on ruined hards, would suggest that there is a lot more in that car than Nick's currently getting out of it. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, there are setup factors as well. And, you know, they, they may be on entirely different pages with that sort of thing. Um, this is the, 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 the thing with Nick for me is he's a really nice guy. Nice doesn't necessarily get you very far in a sport like Formula One where you sort of need to be a bit more cutthroat and a bit more ruthless to actually get ahead. And so far, I haven't really seen any of that sort of not agree. I wouldn't use the word aggression. I don't think that's right in a sport where you could potentially kill somebody by being, you know, too aggressive. But we haven't seen that sort of like that drive for you know, no pun intended there, but that drive or that hunger or that desire to actually push that team further than where it is at the moment. Um, and you'd expect that from an incumbent driver. He's been there for what, three years now. Um, he knows the team. Um, he's, he's probably got very good working relationships with, uh, with, you know, with the bulk of them and it, he's where he was three years ago. So um, yeah, I hate to say it, but this is the sort of performance that, would make a team start looking elsewhere for another driver. But um, yeah, bit of a poor weekend all round. So reset, go again at Imola. Um, you know, it's not his first time driving there. Um, so yeah, hopefully things improve. But at the moment, it's, yeah, it's not the sort of performance you'd expect from somebody who's been in this uh, in the sport for a wee while now. William's currently looking for a new supplier of coffee machines to uh, replace the Lavazza when that sponsorship drops. But uh, Tom, let's talk about the last of the runners, Fernando Alonso. Um, obviously had the issues yesterday in qualifying, um, started on the hards and moved over to the mediums. And I think that was where his race sort of went wrong today because, you know, with the tyre issues that people are experiencing on the medium tyres, you know, graining, it wasn't lasting as well or performing as well as some people hoped. Um, when he pitted for those mediums, I fully expected him to catch up with the Mercedes at, before the end of the race, just based on race pace alone. But he just fell backwards and then ultimately pitted again to um, try and take the fastest lap away from Charles Leclerc. And he would have done if Charles didn't actually do his final lap to the extent they did. But it just, you know... It just wasn't there for Fernando Alonso this weekend. No, sorry, Spain. I think I upset Spain last time I was on. I'm going to do it again. Um, and especially if my maths is correct and I look at who I'm going to have next, I'm definitely going to upset Spain. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, OK, fine. So he had a he had an issue in qualifying. Not his fault. Um, debatable, but probably, you know, probably not really his fault. So you, I can I can take that. You know, it's it's. It's uh, it's an annoying thing that's happened and it and it's ruined disqualifying. But at the end of the day, he started 
in 10th in a car that was quick enough to be fourth on the grid or third on the grid as he was proclaiming uh, in the way that only Fernando Alonso can. This has been my best result ever. This has been my, I, this, I'm faster than I've ever been. And, you know, at some point, someone's got to call him out on it. But uh, he started 10th in a car that's the fourth quickest car and he's ended up last of the runners like, or pretty much last of the runners, I think, was it, um, uh, there was, I think, one what, one person he was ahead of, maybe, or was he actually last of the runs? I think he was last of the runs, wasn't he? And he's had to make an extra pit stop, and when he was on track, he just fell backwards, and it's, it's just like, I don't know if it's just horrendous strategy, or if it's just like I, I just don't understand what he's what he's doing this this race. I mean, he's um his the best thing he did for me in the whole race was when um Gasly checked himself when Max came out of the pit, so he didn't challenge him, and then he just nipped ahead of him, which was quite cheeky. And uh, but then staying out under the safety car was that was never going to work. I I don't understand what he did, why he was doing that. I mean. I suppose you've got to just gamble these things, but was he was he trying to end up like in fourth place and then get another red flag or safety car and just inherit it? Was he was he basically shooting for the stars and and ended up you know trying to hit the moon instead? I don't know. It's a really bad analogy, but uh, yeah, it just didn't work for him. I, I I just don't understand where his where his race went so badly wrong because it was absolutely horrendous. He was he was just nowhere. And the, unless the only thing I can think of is Alpine seemed to have this. This thing where they want to be seen by the cameras. You know, they're purposely letting their drivers battle, which is losing them time and losing a potential position, but it gets them time on TV for the sponsors. Um, I don't know how much BWT are putting in, but it's clearly a lot. Because that seems to be what they wanted. So, you know, leaving Alonso out is going to put him up there fighting for a podium for a few laps. It's going to ruin his race. He's not going to get any points, but it's going to get us more TV time. That's the only thing I can think of, because that's the only really explanation as to why the strategy was so bad. So I'm just really disappointed because, you know, I'm saying this out of love as well for Fernando because I do genuinely think he's a, he's a phenomenal driver, but he's just, it just don't, I just don't know where it's all going so wrong and it's, it's not getting any better. And I just hope I'm wrong and I hope he comes back. And But I, I just think that Ocon, for me, seems to be the future of that team. And I'm not even a massive fan of Ocon. So I, I just don't know where that team's going or what it's doing. And I can see it, you know, they've got a decent car this year and I can see it going backwards. I can see them, you know, fighting with Aston Martin down the back of the field, you know, doing what Alfa Tori did last year, having a, a car that was potentially third or fourth best car on the grid and ended up finishing sixth or seventh in the championship. And it's just not really good enough, to be honest. And it's not all down to Fernando, but um, it's just the team needs to take a good hard look at itself and, and, and improve because it's it's just not doing what it should do with the materials it's got. You're starting in 10th place in a quick car. Look at a quick strategy. Start them on the soft tyres. Get them past a few cars. Make an early stop when there's a pit stop. You know, I guess if we started on the hard tyres, why... <laughs> What would have been a danger in starting in the soft tyres? We know how racy Alonso can be. Get him ahead of a few cars. There's bound to be an early safety car. It's Australia. So, you know, early safety car. He's in the pit. Stick him on the hard tyres. Go to the end. You're looking at a fourth or fifth place. And that's me. I'm a fan. And, I, and I've thought of that. And that, that seemed to have worked. I mean, even starting him on the mediums would have been better than what they did. So just, just a bit annoyed, really. As you can tell, I'm very annoyed at Alpine in general today. So sorry, Spain. I'll see you in a few minutes. Uh, to use one of Fernando's own phrases, it was a bit of a GP2 strategy um, from Alpine there. But uh, Tom Downey, uh, Max Verstappen, DNF'd on lap 38. He, his whole demeanour about it suggested he knew it was coming. You know, they said before the race that Red Bull were having had a threat of reliability issues. And we've seen it before, you know, the Red Bull powertrain whilst it can deliver quite a performance, it's just so fragile. And ultimately, you know, it's things like this that could end up costing um, and currently looks like it could be costing, even though we're on race three out of 25, 24, whatever it's going to be this season. You know, Verstappen and Red Bull are shot at the championship this season. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, as a Max fan, it was painful to see him conk out, but... You're absolutely right, Rubes. That it does sound like um, it does sound like it, it, it was a known issue. He, you know the the the, the, the way the, the way Max. You, you know it was it was it was the whole radio message in his holding. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, well, we knew that was coming. Um, yeah, apparently he was having work done on his car right before the start of the race or something. I'm not quite sure what the story is there. Um, 
But yeah, it's also interesting that because Perez obviously asked, you know, what happened to Max, and Hubert says oh, it's nothing to do with us. You know, don't don't worry about it. So that does somewhat indicate that maybe it was you know Max just it was a specific issue on Max's car. Um, yeah, but th- that that Red Bull powertrain, th- you know, it, it is a derivative of, of Honda somewhat. Um, it's it is disappointing to see because that Honda unit was so reliable last year. So the only reason Max had a had an engine penalty was for, was for the accident at Silverstone. So he, that PE was you know, was more or less completely naffed, and it got damaged then in Hungary as well. Um, but the way it's going on at the minute, he's going to end up taking engine penalties. Uh, and aside from signs, we haven't really seen any Ferrari power unit issues. Yes, we're early on into the season. Um, but yeah, that you know, you know, Max was driving a good race um, up until then. You know, he was looking nailed on for P two. I don't think he was ever going to challenge for the win. I think Le- Le- Leclerc just completely had the measure of him. Um, but but yeah, but Max Ma- Ma- Max was on for he was on for he was on for P two. Red Bull were on for a two three on the podium, um, and then unfortunately his car, uh, well his car's power unit, which has. Um, you know, it's 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 about as reliable as my emotions. It's um, you know, it uh, it it decided that it was going to channel its inner sort of Honda 2017, 2015, and just absolutely pack itself. Unfortunately, uh, so yeah, you know, you know, it's not not much to say about Max. You know, he he he, you know, it was at the safety car restart. Um, you know, he was basically told by JP, you know, look. Just behave a bit. You know, you can't be, you know, you can't be practically trying to kiss the back of Leclerc's helmet. You know, you've got to, uh, um, you know, you know, you you've got to, you know, you, you've got to, you got to keep the car behind. Um, interesting note. Apparently, it was a fuel issue with uh, with with Max's car, um, which does somewhat make sense. I thought it was either going to be fuel or hydraulics because he said there was a weird smell. Um, and then the car just, just and obviously it caught fire, so that does indicate fuel, especially with it being this E10 mixture, it's not going to smell like regular old gasoline. You know, it's going to have, um, you know, it's, 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 it's going to have an element of you know, just something different in it. So, yeah, so just disappointing Sunday because he was on for a bob load of points. But if, you know, if, if, if the reliability carries on like this, he's already on a back foot on a championship. Um, Leclerc's going to walk away with it, or Perez might even take over. Dun, dun, dun. I imagine I, I can't tell if I'd be happy or not, um, for the sake of you know my Lewis fandom, but you know, it, it's Formula One, uh, these things happen, and to actually win, you have to be able to finish, so there is that. And speaking of drivers who have been in, unable to finish, Steve. Sebastian Vettel, first race of the season for him. You know, maybe he just wanted to be a bit traditional and start the season in Australia as usual. But, you know, he had a horrendous weekend, you know. Um, I think it was basically about 23 laps of the race. Well, 23 laps of the weekend that he's done. Um, and 22 of those were during the race. Um, but ultimately, you know, he... Uh, what where was it? He went wide and uh crashed. When was it? Uh he went wide and crashed when he spun coming off the curb at turn four, turn five, something along those lines. I think um, it was turn eleven he went off because it was the same turn that he went wide at uh during the race as well. I think. Um I made a note of it and I'm really annoyed that I can't see my note. Um <laughs> Vettel, yeah, I've apparently just not written it down. But anyway, um, yeah, he had an unfortunate race weekend. And ultimately, Aston Martin are the only team right now to have not scored a point this season. Indeed. And uh, if you want to go out and buy the scooter that Seb was uh, quite fond of, it's a UK 110. Uh, and for New Zealand customers, there's actually a $300 store credit on those scooters as well. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, this is not how to do it. 
do Formula One. Um, <laughs> uh, not a great weekend. Obviously, he's been crook for the last few weeks with uh, with COVID nineteen. So it was nice to see him back. Um, but uh, yeah, not a um, yeah. Just 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 <laughs> this was a bit of a non-event. Um, I do apologize as well. I think we were talking about two different crashes. I was referring to the crash from qualifying as well at T11. Um, he did go and visit the gravel at T11 just to make sure that the uh, track marshals had uh, replaced the gravel exactly as it was before he entered the uh, the sand pit there. But um, yeah, just not not a great weekend. I did write down, because um, obviously we didn't see originally what happens uh, to Seb's car when he, where, uh, it looked like he parked it um to steward a mechanical or something so i wrote seb's car died on lap 24 poured out a drink that was a note for me uh and then i added correction seb decided to show his car what he thinks of it because quite honestly it's been a bit of a dog so far this season um yeah it's uh, it's an impressive looking paperweight for for want of a bit of a ter- better term on relative pace it's absolutely nowhere um and i think uh, like Seb's accident was a bit strange um, coming out of T4 basically ran incredibly wide onto the curb and the whole car basically just un- uh, unseated, just unloaded the whole thing and it just spat itself off uh, in the direction of its choosing. Um, yeah, bit of a strange accident and whether that was down to uh, just poorly optimized setup due to, just due to um, you know, lack of running or just Seb not having a huge amount of confidence in the car or Seb just not being hugely confident in general, um, he's he's not had a very good time of it of late. Um, last year with Aston Martin was uh, shaky at best. Um, obviously, a couple of highlights, but um, yeah, overall, it's I don't think his time at Aston Martin has necessarily necessarily reflected his uh, known talent. So, yeah, it's it's a real shame. Um, there are obviously concerns around just his, uh, I suppose, motivation as well. Um, I'll tell you what, if I was driving a car that was that hyped up and then turned out to be that just quite frankly awful, um, I would find it very hard to be motivated as well. I'm not a Formula One driver. I don't have the mentality or the the uh, mental resilience or anything like that of of somebody who is required to compete at this level of sport. But, um, you know, I, uh, you know, in sporting events I've done, whether it's mountain biking or motorcycle racing or whatever it might be, the last thing you want and the worst thing that you can have is absolutely no faith in the equipment that's underneath you because that will just cause a horrible accident. And that's exactly what's happened to me in the past. Um, and whether that's... Uh, whether that's an element of, uh, you know, the issues that Seb's having or not, I don't know. Um, he's had some horrific crashes himself. These cars are very safe, but we've seen, you know, very recently just how, you know, how very quickly it can all go wrong for, for anyone. Um, and I do wonder whether, you know, I t- at this stage, I'm wondering whether Seb's actually going to finish out the year because, you um, it's just not started out very well. Obviously, there are some significant fundamental issues within that team around how it's, you know, not not necessarily how it's structured, but just how it's working. It doesn't seem very well oiled at all. And yeah, it's just a it's just a bit of a shame. And I I prefer Seb to go out as the guy he is at the moment, the person that quite frankly everyone loves because he just he is a he's he's very, very uh, he's very blunt. He's incredibly supportive of, of uh, you know, movements that quite frankly need it. Um, and I honestly think he could do far more off track than he does on at the moment. I mean, if he devoted his time to somewhere where he would be appreciated because, um, you know, sometimes you get the impression that he, um, that he might not be, which is a bit of a shame. But um, yeah, in general, rough weekend. Go again, Seb. Go again, Seb. Absolutely. Um, Tom Horrocks, finally coming back to you for the Spaniard Carlos signs. Um, we apologize to any Spanish fans if you have any issues with Tom Horrocks. You can direct your emails to um, sorry at f1chronicle.com. 
Um, it's a website that I just invented. But Tom, uh, Carlos signs. He got one lap done. Um, beached in the gravel. He lost great whilst trying to overtake Mick Schumacher on the outside. Um, horrible start. And that is pretty much... It sounds like cliff nuts, but that is pretty much all that happened for Carlos Sainz this race. Well, um, your description of his race was longer than his race. So, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, yeah, bye, Spain. Sorry. Um, I do, you know, I'd like to caveat what I'm about to say by saying I am a huge Carlos Sainz fan. Um, I, I found myself cheering for Ferrari this year, which is something after the Schumacher years I thought I would never see myself doing. And I was I was hoping for a Carlos Sainz World Championship this year. So this is born out of love for the guy. So, I mean, you've got the car, the quickest car on the grid today. The car that's that is that is should win the race and will probably win the race by a country mile. I think that was clearly proven despite safety car periods that Charles Leclerc was pulling out, you know, six, seven, six second gap, eight second gap, safety car comes in, you know, safety car kills the gap, 10 second gap, safety car kills the gap. He still finished half a minute ahead of Sergio Perez. That car was by far the quickest car on track. And in Carlos Sainz's hands, it would have been at worst half a second, three tenths of a second slower than Charles Leclerc. Yet on the first lap, he's lost five spaces at the start. And then he's just got desperate trying to recover, ended up you know, barreling off track and ended up in the gravel race over. You know, it's it's just, I think he's really feeling the pressure, which is a real shame because he was such a cool customer the last couple of seasons, his McLaren years and last year, he showed that, you know, he, what he could do in the right machinery. And this this race and this season in general, he's just not been up to the task. Uh, he's got the dubious honour of, of being the first retirement in two Australian Grand Prix in a row, granted with a two-year absence. But, uh, uh, you know, that, that's actually kind of like not the worst thing that's happened to him this weekend. I mean, his qualifying as well. Yes, he was very unlucky with the red flag, which meant he lost his lap. But, you know, we've seen other drivers be in the situation before. We've seen Verstappen, we've seen Hamilton that have been in a situation where they've lost their laps and they've they've got it all in one lap. They've got to get it right in one lap. He had two laps. He had two attempts. He, you know, he, was, he put in three attempts at, at fast laps in qualifying and... The first one was struck off, fair enough, bad luck. Second one, he balls up and then had to pull out and then go for and go for another run. Third one, he went off track and then ended up P9. You know, so he had three he had three cracks at it. One was taken out of his hand, the other two he messed up. So he's he has fundamentally ruined his race before it's even started. And then instead of trying to recover in the race, he just gets desperate. And I'm so I think now where he is now, it's it's a definite number two situation. I can't see him coming back from this now it's it was he needed a, a solid recovery drive you know to reasonable points fifth sixth would have been a you know slightly disappointing but hey ho you're stuck in traffic you can't overtake but instead he's just thrown it all away on the first lap and he's ruined his entire weekend again and it's just a big disappointment and i and and again this has all come out of love for carlos science it's a massive disappointment for me i really want him to do well i really want him to to challenge declare but I mean, I'm just slightly concerned now that this is going to be it for the season. Yeah, you know, with uh, with Max having issues and um, and you know Perez looking better, but still only five points ahead of Max, despite Max having two retirements. It's uh, it's it looks like it's going to be this Leclerc just going off into the distance now, um, because science is probably not going to be a match for him. And the only hope for the season is now, for, uh, as things stand at the moment, is that science is going to be able to be up there with Leclerc. So um, if it is going to be a Ferrari domination this year, which is no, is no by all means not a certainty. I just hope Carlos Sainz can can improve and, uh, for the sake of the show, be up there with Leclerc because at the moment I'm not convinced he can, which is a big disappointment really for me. Sorry, Spain. I promise I will be more, po- more positive next time I'm on. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. Um, Ferrari's ethos is has generally been we have a one and two driver. You know, Matteo Bonotto said at the start of this weekend. You know, we don't have one and two. We have our two drivers. Um, but then, you know, when Sainz is now 38 points behind Charles Leclerc and they clearly have a favourite to win the championship, Leclerc's going to get every, um, you know, decision going his way from the Ferrari management team. But hey-ho, it's sometimes the way Formula One's got to go. But let's talk about our star of the race. So... 
Uh, let's start with you, Tom Downey. Who was your driver of the day, please? Um, I think you've got to give it to Charlotte Claire, you? Just bossed it. Just Dominic did, did everything he needed to do. Held out, a good, held out a good win. Never really looked in trouble, especially once um, once Max DNF'd. You know, he was he was home and dry. Yeah, you know, just uh, and also the first uh, pulse to win the Australian Grand Prix since what two thousand and twelve, I think. It's something mad like that, I, and I'm sure it's the first pulse to win in the Turbo Hybrid era in Australia. Uh, Lewis was the last driver to win from Polar Albert Park in twenty fifteen. Oh, well, I stand so corrected. none of that was right. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, shut. <laughs> yeah, um, what? Yeah, yeah, okay. Go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, but you know, you know, my my ignorance aside, um, it is you know, it, it, it is it is still a while since since since, since we've had a pulse to actually win the race. So it's you know, since, so still since twenty fifteen, goes to show how long ago that is now. Um, given that I thought it was a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump in right now and say, yeah, Charles Leclerc had an utterly dominant performance today and would win my drive of the day as well. The closest we got was a wobble during, I think, the second safety car restart, um, where you know he had to put the power off a little bit because he went a bit wide on the final corner um, and nearly lost it to Max, but you know recovered and retained the lead but steve your driver of the day, your driver of the day please has to be somebody on track doesn't it i can't give an honorary driver of the day to someone um uh it'll be albon for me to be honest i just think like just mighty effort in a car that obviously isn't um uh isn't amazing uh relatively speaking and yeah 58 laps on just, just, uh, just basically cheese by that point just absolutely ruins tires um yeah i i, I was actually going to say honorary driver of the day even though he was on the red bull red bull pit wall uh glam rockerline uh, or rocky uh seb's old uh crew chief and if you're wondering who he is uh he's the guy who screams uh du bist weltmeister uh down the radio at seb uh, in 2010 in Brazil when he won the championship. Um, Rocky is off to uh, the Red Bull Junior program to make sure that Helmut Marco doesn't ruin the uh, careers of any more children. Um, so he's my honorary driver of the day, but uh, on-track driver would be Albon. I actually think that was a pretty mighty effort to do what he did. And it was... Uh, I, I was quite nervous that they weren't going to bring him in. Gonna, bleh, weren't going to bring him in. I thought it was some weird protest following the... Uh, qualifying disqualification so yeah uh fair play to him well done drove on cheese 58 laps good stuff nice nice indeed and tom who is your driver of the day i assume it's a spaniard uh i i could like try and just annoy some people and say color size but no um well it's mary poppins in it he was practically perfect in every way uh it was just a slight little uh little as you say on the restart he just went a little bit wide and that was his only mistake Dominated the entire race, you know, led every lap, defended when he did make that one error, and it's perfect, to be honest. It was a brilliant, brilliant performance for him. Only other people I would have potentially suggested would have been Alex Albon, um, and in the interest of balance as well, George Russell, you know, took advantage, stayed ahead of Hamilton, good performance all round, but they're the only other people, you know, you could potentially say Daniel Ricciardo for the pressure of the home crowd and everything that he's had to go through, and but it's he's the, Leclerc's the only one, really, He's uh, it's got to go to him. For me yeah absolutely and now that we've rounded everybody off it's time to give you an opportunity to promote so tom downey um is there anything you want to plug obviously everything f1 yeah so um there's people listening probably aware by now i'm part of everything f1 uh you can find us across all our socials uh we are with, with the handle at join the f1 um so that's facebook twitter instagram uh, apparently we do TikTok. Apparently that's a thing. I'm far too old and and socially inept to, to know what that is or how to do it or what to do. So if you see anything on there, that'll be one of our young whippersnappers and certainly not me who's posting content. Um, I prefer to sit, sit down with a good old book. Um, but there we are. 
Uh, yes, uh, we also have our website, which is originally redone, um, everything up on .com, chalk. Uh, also, we have a YouTube channel and Discord server, all of which are linked on our websites. But again, if you search everything F1, you can find them. And the creme de la creme is our podcast, which is the Everything One podcast, which you can find on, oh, God, um, I'm never going to be listening to these. Uh, Apple, iTunes, that's the same thing. I should know that I use Apple. Um, Spotify, Google, I don't know, Amazon, Carrier Pigeon, everything you can think of. Yeah, go listen. Check us out, please. Yeah, go do that. And Steve from Formula Shakedown. Hello. Uh, yeah, Formula Shakedown, um, where, which is one part of a conglomerate of many, many quality uh, groups. Um, so uh, obviously Formula Shakedown is uh, is open wheel. Um, so you, uh, if you were at the track or if you were paying attention to any of the support categories, you would have seen the S5000s, which are basically Australian Formula One cars. So they're fueled on uh, 4X and uh, kangaroo meat. Um, they're not. Uh, I'm pretty sure they just run normal, normal petrol. Um, but I, uh, I, I am actually going to plug something slightly, slightly, uh, slightly offbeat, um, just because I like going off track. Um, Bathurst 12 hour, normally on in February, but because of COVID and all that jazz, it's on on the 13th, from the 13th to the 15th of May. And unlike the Bathurst 1000, which is a puny six hour motor race, this is 12 hours of the best GT3 race racing you will ever see. And as much as I love Formula One, I love GT3 more and I got permission to plug it because it actually needs a bit of help. Um, events been canned last couple of years due to COVID. Um, it is incredibly hard for a lot of these international teams to, to travel uh, down under to, to Bathurst. Um, not only is it in Australia, it's in a part of Australia that is reasonably remote. It's on the other side of the Blue Mountains. It's a bit of a pain to get to. Um, last time we had the 12 hour, uh, my boys, the Bentley boys, they finally did it outright win and then M Sport cans their entire GT3 program. So in memory of the 300 kilometer per hour palace that won last time, I would encourage you all to watch. You can watch it free on YouTube in most regions, unless you're in uh, Australia, in which case it's on Seven. And if you're in New Zealand, it's on Sky Sports. So have fun paying them a million dollars to watch one thing. Um, but please, please support the event. It means a lot to uh, to me um, and to uh, obviously to the uh, uh, to the drivers and the teams and so on who uh, who compete. It will be a slightly smaller roster considering a lot of these international teams are busy, busy with GT World Challenge Europe and IMSA and that sort of thing, um, but it will still be a great event nonetheless. So please give it your love, give it your support, make sure the event carries on in future because um, who knows? This is, a, this is a race that people like Daniel Ricciardo have said that they would love to do at one point as well. And Fernando Alonso got very close to doing it a few years ago so um yeah please please go and watch it and join formula shakedown unless you're rude and like swearing at other people for opinions in which case don't please thanks yeah i actually uh, went and joined formula shakedown um finally after the last time that you were on the podcast steve but uh Tom, yes. who is currently joined by a cat at albert park um it is albert park isn't it um, it is Albert Park, yeah. Yes. Uh, Monkey Seat Podcast. Give us a plug or anything yeah. else. So um, non-Spanish listeners can go to monkeyseatpod.com. Uh, we're exclusive. We don't know. Of course, we love everyone there. We've, we've even had a Spaniard on our show uh, as well in the past. So we, we do love the Spaniards, uh, <laughs> despite what I've said today. Uh, yeah, you can find us at monkeyseatpod.com. Uh, all major podcasting platforms. I'm not going to read them out, but you go there. You can click on the podcast link section. You can link to whichever one you want. Uh, they're all listed on there. Um, yeah, we're, we're on the socials. I don't really use Instagram and Facebook, if I'm completely honest. So just catch us on Twitter uh, at Monkey Seat Pod. You can catch me at Tom Horrocks F1 on Twitter. And as you mentioned at the start of the show, I also tend to host a lot of the Fireside F1 episodes. So we should be back this week with another one, hopefully, uh, guest depending, just making sure that uh, time zone wise they can they can come on. So that'll be interesting. Um, no prizes for guessing where said guest is, given where the race was this weekend. So uh, I'll let you find out who that person is later in the week if it happens. So that, that'd be good fun. But yeah, come and give us a listen. 
absolutely do. And uh, they do occasionally live stream their shows as well as um, I jo joined the audience for a recent one. Um, but yeah, if you want to find me on any of the socials, I am at Rubes, R-U-U-B-E-Z on the majority of them. You might stick some zeros and some ones behind it on others where someone else got to it first. Um, but mostly I just tend to host these these days. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the ones that I do and the ones that I don't as well. Um, but Grid Talk is available on YouTube, as you can tell if you are watching the live stream right now. Um, most episodes are recorded live. Um, I'm just going to note that if you are watching the YouTube stream, we apologize about the frame rate. We're testing a new live streaming system, and it seems that some devices aren't as efficient at doing so as others. Um, not naming any brands, but a certain Bill Gates has a lot to answer for. Um, but yeah, we are also available on Amazon, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula One Grid Talk for our back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights, and better recording equipment. You can get your hands on some official Grid Talk merchandise on f1chronicle.com forward slash store. And also make sure you subscribe so you first know when each new episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty of more F1 content. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to our panellists for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Yeah, what they said. Always a pleasure. And goodbye. Recording there, there. stopped. Cool. Um, yeah, so we'll just carry on for a bit whilst... Um, no there's some stuff to go on, but I want to go back to um, the album Pit Stop and how we were all like, is he going to not pit? Is he going to? Mm. Um, the last time I remember this being such a thing was, I think it was Canada, um, 2010, 2011. Um, and there was like three cars, including like Massa and Alonso yet to pit with like maybe two laps to go. And they all pitted on the penultimate lap. But when was the last time we actually saw someone not pit? Ocon last year in in Turkey. I think I was asleep for that race because of work. <laughs> yeah, Possibly. and um, and that stroll was... and stroll in Monza twenty twenty as well. But that was because they changed tires under red flag. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the, the stroll Monza perhaps doesn't quite count because you still use two compounds. If we're talking about you know, you know just, sorry to be a bit of a sort of like dick or something, but if if we're talking about someone who only used one compound in a race. Um, yeah, it was Ocon last year. It was when it was mm. the... It, but it was also a wet race, so there's, there was no obligation to change tyres. And his right. tyres had practically become slick by the end of it anyway. So I'm struggling. I've seen it happen in other series. Um, I've never seen it happen in this. Um, I, I, I don't actually think there's a, there's, a, there's a standard like punishment or penalty for it. I was under the impression it was a 30 second time penalty, but so was I, right. yeah. um, I can say with almost absolute certainty that that penalty has never been applied because the first right. time it was um, certainly um, since the 90s when um, was it 98 when Schumacher at, didn't Silverstone. Stop at Silverstone. I yeah. remember I was I was I was working in a pub washing glasses that day and, uh, and I was just basically <laughs> standing over the sink and just washing glasses watching this race unfold and seeing Hackett and do spins across the grass and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah so I'll yeah. never forget that race and uh, yeah, yeah. Him, stop, him stopping in the pits in the entire pub basically um, basically seeing him finish the race in the pits going what there you go yeah. Yeah. do that so yeah i i can say with reasonable certainty that that is the only time it's happened certainly since 1992 when i started yeah. watching yeah yeah he's done it before as well old michael he did it what 1994 to ignored black flags at silverstone after he passed damon hill on a safety on a uh was it the parade lap that he passed him on Yes, he did, did it twice, Thanks. didn't he? Yeah. He did it because yeah, there, there was a there was a restart, and he did it on the uh, on the second formation lap as yes. well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Um, while we've been recording, the mud slinging between Red Bull and Mercedes has uh, has kicked off. Uh, what said? Uh, George Russell, it doesn't matter how fast your car is if you don't make it until the end. That's what uh, I said. George Hunt, you were driving a Williams. Why aren't you knackered? The Christian Horner. I'd rather fix a fast car than try and make a slow car reliably fast. 
Oh, Subaru Jetta. <laughs> yeah, I heard, I heard both. Of they, they were just before, oh, uh, in, in the post-race, I think, those interviews came out. But yeah, oh, it's, uh, oh, it's definitely some jabs. Here you go. There. Here you go, boys. Read the lines from, from corporate. Read the lines. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, so just going to briefly sort of like run, run over the uh, comments from the live chat, just um, mm-hmm. to save George's hardware, the uh, stress that it's been going through for the last um, hour and a half. But um, Jason Pettigrew, Tom Downey, the GOAT, um, yeah, that fan club is strong. Stop it. Stop um, it. When are we going to get Tom Downey merch? That's what I want to know. I don't know. I am th- I'm a thick-ass boy, so it's going to need to be some big merch. Um, from SHT, uh, no points for Alonso, no mood to celebrate. Two weekends in a row where Alonso could pick up massive points. All opportunities got wasted. Um, we talked about this during the show, but, you know, it was just a horrible weekend um it's been a hor- it's not been the best season so far for fernando alonso and um does anyone reckon he might retire at the end of the season if it doesn't go his way if, he, doesn't, yeah. he doesn't want to but i think yeah. he might not have a choice yeah especially especially if el plan doesn't go to plan then yeah he's a uh, I, I don't i don't foresee him carrying on the after because he said he wants to come back to win a championship and that ain't gonna happen, is it? No. Maybe our plan is to finish dead last and somehow take the take championship. There might just be some higher level thinking that we haven't quite grasped onto yet. Yeah, I I, I, I haven't grasped onto that either. No, uh, I think in all seriousness, like though. Oh, sorry, Ruby. You I was just gonna say, is it gonna be like a playground Bernie style thing where like you get to the last race and it's just like, all right, winner takes all, and then the uh, dive bombs everybody else. <laughs> oh, that sounds awfully like what happened last year. Funny that, um, Funny. you know. <laughs> Toto, it's called the motor race. <laughs> we went motor racing, Toto. Um, uh, yeah, I think in all seriousness, um, there's two elements uh, that go against Alonso's continuation in the series. One is his results, and two is Oscar Piastri. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, <laughs> like, Oscar's obviously just frothing for it like he wants that drive and I, like i think he'll get it like he he just he he can't sit on the sideline for two he, he's too good to to just be sidelined for for like the fact that he's not able to really do anything this year is a bit it's a bit criminal if you ask me um the third but, point as well is ocon's contract yeah true yeah, yeah. I mean, when does that expire like 2085 or something stupid i think he's got three more years after this year yeah, he's. I think he's a second. No, he's third longest next to Max uh, and Leclerc. I think Legreg and Max. Yeah, and Lando Leclerc. now. Lando's got the longest one now. Oh, true. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like 20, 20, 28 or something stupid, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Uh, um, yeah. Like as much as I love seeing Fernando back, I mean, I'm I'm a big Fernando fan. Like, I mean, come on, he's. <sighs> his idea of winning a championship is just an idea i don't it's not going to happen miracles would need to happen for that to happen yeah um what else we got another from sht for verstappen the reigning champion to have two dnfs in the first three races just very bad for him again we discussed this during the podcast but and we just discussed it now as well really like you know you need you need a car that's going to finish if you want to win the championship and I think arguably they were saying that, um, you know, like in 2020 and stuff and 2019, that one of the problems really was just having that reliability and not finishing races that just put puts you out of contention for the championship. And, you know, like we say, you need to finish. Like every season Verstappen's had in Red Bull, except for last year. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if you look at what happened to Lewis in 2016, it was largely reliability that sort of went, to, that, you know, that ran against him at the end of that. As yeah, well, well, so. yeah, well, yeah. 2016 for Lewis, you look at so it was it was Malaysia, wasn't it? Where he went, oh no, yeah. no, when his engine just because yeah. because he was well off down the road. It was 30 seconds yeah. ahead. Yeah, yeah. That uh, like that, you know, that that all that, regardless of the team or the driver, that continuing to happen is just not gonna. It's not going to get you very far. He could win every race he starts, but if he only, you know, finishes four races in a season, hundred points. 
So, so far, yeah, he has won it. every race he finished. This is true. Max Verstappen, 2022 world champion. I mean, Confirmed. he's number one. He's finished one race and he's won one race. What more can you ask for? <laughs> <laughs> it's the curse oh, of being dear. number one, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. A yeah. uh, comment from Infinite TK. Uh, I think this is in regards to Lewis' uh, his complaints. Um, he didn't blame the team. He said that because his engine was overheating as he was catching George, so he had to back off. Hmm. Okay. Um, but even me, when Lewis said it, I was just a bit like, shut up, please. You know? Yeah. I heard him saying to Bono, you know, pretty pretty clearly, like, you know, it was on the uh, on the broadcast that um the team had put him in a uh, he, I think he said, he used the term you've put me you guys have put me in a difficult position or something along those lines. Yeah. So, um yeah, I mean read into that what you will, but that's to me that's not on. Like he he should know better. Um, he did he did say after the race they 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 said oh on, on the face of it that's a good result. Um mm. or I think it, who it was one of the uh comments one of the um journalists said on the face of it it's a good result and the way that they were wording it looked like they were trying to get him to then to then kind of be negative, but then his response of no, it's a great result for the team, it's really good. And yeah, he said it mm. genuinely. I think it was born out of frustration. Yeah, he should know yeah. better. Oh, yeah, but yeah, it, yeah. It was definitely born yeah. out of frustration. I think what he meant yeah. by difficult position is like they like say they're having to manage temperatures and not be able to push ahead, whereas he thought he had the pace to catch and pass Perez, like he'd shown earlier in the race. But now mm. that he was behind George, to then try and get past George in the same car would have put too much strain on the engine and the car and everything. I think it's more kind of from that. But again, you know, as you said before, he's benefited from it in the past. And in very recent times, he's been heavily um, affected negatively by it as well. So yeah. it's just one of these things. Swings and roundabouts, 23 races, and it will happen in his favour in other races. So just got to suck it up and get on with it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. True, yeah. Um, and we got two from George responding to um, SHG, but uh, very disappointing for Fernando. Neither Saudi nor Australia were his fault, but that won't help his mood when his teammate got good points again today. So just very obviously true. addressing the gulfing class between those two drivers at the minute. Um, and look like Max has already given up on the title in his interview today. Long way to go still, of course. You know, we've just finished race three in an over 20 race championship. It's not <sighs> over yet. Um, and, you know, in 2016, obviously Lewis ultimately lost that season, but um, Lewis overcame a gap of like when his teammate had just won like the previous four races, um, and he had very unfortunate scenarios. But you know, like we say, it's not over until um, the uh, final flag goes down. I wouldn't right. David Croft sings. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh! I'd rather <laughs> I'd rather cheese grate my nipples and listen to Crofty sing. Oh dear! Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say Max has given up on the championship, but he is going to be feeling pretty put out, and I and and I think I think he's got every reason to be feeling put out at the minute because he, you know. He's sick in the championship. <laughs> you what? He's sick in the championship. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and he's having terrible reliability issues. Can you not, please? Sorry, my cat's just. Is off. that to the cat or to Max's Red Bull? Both. Okay. Um, <laughs> I also think the same to Max's Red Bull whenever I see it on track. Yeah. Oh, can you not, please? Yeah. <laughs> can you not? Yeah. <laughs> Do, 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 do you know what? Do you know what Max? You, you know this. You know when Max just got like super close to the safety, you know, behind, whereas in front of the safety car restart. Do you know? Do you know what I always used to think? You know when you'd open a bag of Maltesers and you get two stuck together. That's what Max would remind me of the way you just like glued to the car in front. Yeah, I love how they had to visualize like how you need to operate now behind the safety. Yeah, 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 it's like getting peanut butter st stuck in Velcro. It's just never coming out. It's oddly specific, I know, but like I feel know, like I there's a story here. No, there's not, and we're not going into that. Um, <laughs> there is a story, but it's going to take far too long. Um, That's right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's only called it's only called to eleven here. Pray tell. <laughs> 
Or maybe we'll time. wait till we stop streaming. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's definitely, I don't think it's stream safe, no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, just adding on to uh, just the sort of, how would I describe this? Not Verstappen's mood, but just I, like he said, I think like two thirds of the way through last year that like it doesn't really matter to him whether he wins the world championship or not. I'm inclined to believe him, but I don't think the way he said it is the way, like the 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 way it was perceived as, you know, necessarily in line with the way he said it. I think he's just very aware of the fact that he's so he's still very very young. Uh, the absolute giant of the sport, which is Lewis Hamilton, is probably in his last couple of seasons. Let's be honest. Um, I think he's just very aware of the fact that he's got a lot more time to work with. Um, in terms of his career uh yeah he'll be challenged he's got like i mean you know charles leclerc is the uh is the benchmark for this year um and he has properly stepped up and that's like that's that's something to that's a factor to bear in mind but i think for the staff and when he when he turned around and said that he wasn't too worried about last year and you know he when we saw him in the garage after his car um decided to spontaneously combust today um he didn't look all that frazzled i mean we've seen what max looks like when he's upset in the past i didn't see that i just saw okay it happens you know sort of you know we sort of expected it um you know pack up the uh pack up the garage go to italy see in two weeks or whenever whenever it is so yeah i i don't think he's overly concerned at this point because he's just got a lot of time in his pocket yeah um, 